Welcome to Surgipod, the podcast that delivers you all the latest trends and developments from the world of surgical practice administration. Each episode, you will hear from thought leaders in the sector sharing their valuable knowledge, insights, and predictions from a range of perspectives. And now for your host, Justin Rockman, Vice President of Surgimate, the leading surgical scheduling and coordination technology provider. Enjoy the podcast. Welcome everybody back to the Surgipod. I'm very, very excited to have a top tier CEO join us today. Uh, Stephanie Collins is a CEO at uh, Austin Retinum in the great state of Austin, uh, great state of Texas, sorry. And um, really, it's a real pleasure to uh, have you join today. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. Great. So firstly, tell me a little bit about your own sort of personal journey to becoming CEO uh, at Austin, uh, Austin Retinum. Wow. Um, I started at Austin Retina, if you can believe it, 21 years ago. I was uh, sent to Austin Retina as the file clerk for my temp service. Um, and after my mandatory 90 days, I was hired on. And I've actually worked in every position in the organization except for um, research. I took over from for the previous administrator when she retired after 23 years um, in 2014. And I became the CEO. Uh, it's been an interesting, it's been a really interesting journey, um, for sure. They, they're a great organization, super supportive, um, very encouraging. I got my undergrad and graduate degree while I was working there, um, more recently, just, uh, in the midst of COVID and for fun, maybe, or supportive of like health issues. Um, I have also, um, become a certified health coach and I'm looking forward to sharing that knowledge as well. Wow. So in the last seven years, we've been CEO, you've really, as I said, covered all those different roles. How important is it to have both the clinical experience which you have and also the business and administrative experience in order to be able to uh, really actively play the role which you play as CEO at the practice? Yeah, I mean, I do truly believe that um, anyone can be a leader, right? I mean, you don't have to have all of the background that I have to be a fantastic leader and CEO. I think anybody can do that as long as they're open to, you know, collaborating and, and being a good listener and supporting and encouraging their staff. Um, but I do think that it has benefit, benefited me along the way. It's, it's really nice to really understand where my staff are coming from. Even though I may have not worked on the front line in many years, I do understand the general sense of their job and what they're talking about. And so if they're excited about implementing a new process in our organization, I know what may or may not, wor not work, or if they're really frustrated about something, I can relate to that. Uh, I do try to get down and, and participate on the front lines when I can. So in the midst of COVID, I was helping them COVID screen. I will go back to checking in and checking out just so that I can kind of understand what they're going through. So I think that kind of gives me a little bit of a leg up to support my staff. But I don't think that it's required to become a great CEO, a great leader by any means. All right. So we know you run a very, very tight ship at Austin Retina. And so you as a super efficient in everything uh, which you do and everything which you achieve. Um, maybe describe or give us some examples of two or three different things that you feel are critical to ensure that all the operations and all of the processes um, at the practice run as smoothly as you would hope for them to, to run. Yeah, I think a lot of the uh, success of our practice in being super, uh, super efficient, it really comes from our lean initiative that we did in 2015. So, you know, like any retina practice, probably, or any medical practice, the constant um, worry or complaint from patients with your wait time was a big deal for us. Um, you know, back then we thought, you know, hey, we're this fantastic practice, we have great outcomes, um, we just need to focus on wait time. And so we did this big lean initiative back in 2015. And really what we realized was that um, we had a huge culture shift while we were going through this lean initiative. And what I mean by that is while we were able to identify efficiencies, uh, inefficiencies and, and collaborate with our staff to really become a better practice to provide great care for our patients, we really learned to empower the frontline staff to make those decisions, right? So we're not having them, you know, do high level business decisions about the finances or obviously medical decision making, you know, from the physicians, but if it is general operational or the workflow of the practice or how we can provide a better service to our patients, we empower them to come up with new ideas and trials 
um, and collaborate to, to, you know, get those things done. So I think that that has made us just a better practice in general and to help provide better care. Lean was a huge deal for us. And so we have a multitude of trials that are uh, created by our staff. Mm -hmm. Right. We have a list of them and, and sometimes they work and they don't or they don't work. Sometimes they work for one specific team. So whether that's the insurance department or the call center or maybe one clinical team, maybe they become, um, uh, you know, universal between the whole organization. Right. But it doesn't matter as long as they are creating and empowering themselves to come up with all these ideas. We truly right. believe in a culture of failure. So encouraging them to step outside their comfort zone, come up with new ideas and these trials, try them out. Worst case scenario, we go back to ground zero, we evaluate why it didn't work and we start over, right? right? If they truly believe in the idea, they can tweak it and then kind of go back out. And that allows the physicians to really focus on their patients and what they're medically trained to do. And it also provides a great growth opportunity and uh, team building for the staff at, at its own. Um, yeah. I've seen lots of groups um, try to initiate lean uh, programs and when they communicate those messages about uh, these types of initiatives, it sometimes gets a little bit lost in translation to the staff. It's very esoteric and very conceptual. Um, were there ways in which you were able to sort of ensure the staff um, understood, also adopted and owned um, some of these initiatives? How, how did you go about uh, achieving that? Yeah, I think in, in 2015, it was definitely this idea of like implementing something new and they're like, oh God, <laughs> you know, right? Like it was going to require after hour meetings and extra training, right? But once the staff really started, I mean, even within the first few weeks of them trying something simple as, you know, putting a flag up to signify that there was a room open and filling that room instead of putting them in the sub dilating room they all of a sudden saw improvements in their workflow and the clinical side and the patients were already raving. They were saying, I don't know what you're doing different, but I love it, keep it up, right? And so then that kind of built this excitement and this momentum. Um, and then the, re the relationship between the patient and the employee, right, is a two-way really important connection. That seemed to improve. And so there's just this general excitement in the office. And I think once they kind of got that and everybody was kind of sharing about that, they were propelled to keep going. So there was definitely that original, like, you know, tug of like, oh God, you're making me do something new, right? Or learn something new. But once they started getting that positive feedback, they were, they were um, sailing forward for sure. So celebrating those successes and making sure you did it with baby steps and appreciating what was done correctly. Yeah. Sure. Everything we do now, any new idea that we think about, it's definitely a trial. It's very small baby step just to move us forward in the right direction. We don't just jump, you know, <laughs> head in or whatever, feet in or whatever you want to say. Like we don't just jump in, right? We kind of tip our toe in. We kind of pull some of the staff, pull some of the physicians. What do you think? How is this going to work? Kind of, you know, um, you know, work through all of those concerns and those what ifs and then just trial it, you know, per group or per department um, and see how it goes before we deploy throughout the organization. Right. And of course, with lean and all of these things goes with, you know, goal setting and metrics to make sure that it is actually working. So what is the goal of the trial? What are you trying to achieve? Where are you at right now, right? If you're looking at wait time for a patient, what is your current wait time now? And once you make the change for your trial, what is the end result? And sometimes the result just might be subjective as in the patient felt like they had a better better, you know, exam, right. Or a better visit with us, or maybe it's subjective from the staff. Like maybe our time wasn't even any better, but we felt a sense of relief and a sense of calm that we didn't have before. Right. So it doesn't necessarily have to be numbers driven. It can be subjective as well. Um, and then, you know, providing feedback, the collaboration, the building of trust and the teamwork, all of those things are super important um, within the organization. So you talked about a culture of, you obviously have a culture of success, but also celebrating the culture of failures, um, mm -hmm. which is an interesting uh, concept as well. I'd love for you to maybe expand a little bit about what that means. Yeah, so I, I think a culture of failure and, and failing forward somewhat go hand to hand, right? Um, we want to encourage everybody to fail forward, right? We want you to make those small steps and do those trials to move you and the organization forward to provide a great patient experience um, and also a great employee experience, right? And so we encourage them to do so with all of these small scale trials. Um, but then the culture failure piece really comes in is that if the 
the trial doesn't work out, we're not upset about it, right? Nobody intently harmed a patient or did something wrong. We all agreed that we were going to move forward in this trial to try something out. And if it doesn't work, we revert back to the old way. So that whole, um, if a person makes a mistake and you yell at them or reprimand them, that doesn't really work, right? That doesn't support this culture of, you know, trying something out and seeing what happens. Um, so you have to have some buy-in from that. And that, and that takes a lot of work for sure. Right. You said that you work very closely with all of your teams and you get your hands dirty, go straight into the trenches and working with um, the front office staff. And also I assume the, the, I know you work very closely with the surgical scheduling staff of the practice. What are some of the pet peeves, um, the frustrations that you hear from those different teams from the surgical scheduling staff about what they do or what they have to do with coordinating uh, surgeries, which are very complex in, uh, in your environment for your practice, for your surgeons? Yeah, I mean, I think before we started using your platform, I think a lot of it was just the redundancy of the work, right? They had to, you know, get in the chart, they had to fill out this paper, you know, form by hand, um, every, you know, aspect of the demographics and the insurance stuff. Um, And so, and then even before we got with you guys, we, you know, went from paper to kind of a um, Adobe pre-filled form, which made it a little nicer, but it still was a manual labor and redundant work. And so I think, um, you know, one of the things I talk about with like the trial is like, Hey, let's look for innovation. Let's see if there's something out there that we can offer our staff to supplement their work and make it easy. I mean, we're a really busy practice. Things just keep getting more convoluted, um, and, and harder to meet. And so we, you know, stumbled across surgery made and it's been fantastic. So I think that a lot of the frustration before um, was just, you know, redundant work and having to do a lot of things by hand. Um, and now I think that the frustrations really might just be more on the aspect of just, um, you know, technology in general and not against surgery mate, but, you know, I mean, if your internet goes down you're like, Oh geez, now what? <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> So, I mean, there's nothing you can do about that. Um, But, you know, they also, um, they were one of the first groups for us to really set up like a work from home platform. And uh, that was kind of a new idea for us. That was even before COVID, which was uh, really helpful. We had a couple of random people that were working from home. I would have a random work from home day, but the, the surgery schedulers were the first people. They were taking up an office space on our clinical floor. And we were like, we need more clinic space, right. To be more efficient, to, um, have more space to work at patients. And we're like, we got to get you out of this building. And so that was kind of one of the other uh, drivers to find a new technology to support them to work from home. So now it's great. They can log into your system. It ties into our PM system. It pulls everything over as far as their demographics. They can save, you know, um, they can save templates so they don't have to read, like create a surgery each time. We can download the PDF and fax it right from their computer to the surgery center. So they're not having to deal with all of this paperwork. Um, anyways, it's been, it's been really fantastic, but they were the step in our first direction of getting people work from home and, and it's been a really nice transition. Right. So you talk about technology helping uh, create much better efficiencies, uh, remove, remove all the redundant work. But you also touched on something which is more around the agility and the ability to change how staff are working together. Are there other roles which you see technology playing today at your practice? Um, And also in your thinking as CEO as to where technology is going to help the practice as you move into the future. Yeah, we, um, before, before COVID even started, we, we implemented and started with 13 new softwares. So we are constantly. 13, only 13. 13. Okay. (laughs) Only 13. (laughs) Um, So we are constantly looking, like I said, for anything that will help support our staff, because at some point, you're going to be limited by how many staff you can have in the in the building, right? By like space constraints, uh, maybe financial constraints. So it's not meant to replace a uh, staff by any means. It's just meant to supplement their work and and help offer a more calmer environment. So we are constantly looking for new ideas. Um, we use technology for all sorts of things, like uh, pre-registration for the patients. Um, a parking lot to have patients, you know, wait in their car right now during COVID to spread out in the waiting room. Um, we use the, you know, a two-way texting option to communicate with them and set up expectations. We even use the same two-way texting option to reach uh, potential new hires earlier that are interested in applying for our, our work instead of email and kind of waiting for them to sift through that. We just text them directly, right? Um, so technology has come a long way. We had a referring provider the other day 
rave about the fact that she could refer a patient right through our online platform on our website. So I think that, you know, moving into, I guess, the 21st century out of like 2015 is, is typically a little slow, I think, sometimes in healthcare. But, um, you know, technology is fantastic and you should always use it to supplement your workers, I think. Sometimes I feel that healthcare is not in 2015. They're more like in uh, 1915 when it comes to how they're working within certain surgical practices and That's certain fine. groups. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's almost Halloween, which means it's back to conference season. Summer's basically on its way out. Mm -hmm. um, conferences are a great opportunity to meet with colleagues. Um, I think now uh, is really the first opportunity that a lot of people within the industry are getting to meet with other people. How, how important do you feel it is to uh, sort of work together with your colleagues, other CEOs from either retina practice or ophthalmic practice? Um, some of, what are the sort of the lessons that you've learned uh, from other executives who you've worked with and uh, share knowledge share with? Uh, it, it, is, um, it is something that uh, I would support for anybody. I mean, it is so important to collaborate with people. I mean, even if it's just in general healthcare, so, you know, if it has a general management of healthcare, um, or other subspecialties, we're all living kind of in the same kind of craziness, right. With healthcare and reimbursement cuts and policy changes. And so to have those folks to lean on and collaborate with and understand maybe, what are you using? How is that working for you? How has it benefited you? You know, how did you change this policy? Um, is is something that you, it's just invaluable, really. Um, I have an upcoming conference coming in a week or so, and it's the first live one that I've been since COVID. Um, I'm super excited to see my peers and and get back together. Um, while some of us have been doing virtual Zoom meetings to keep in touch, or maybe um, emailing back and forth, which is super helpful, right? If you need to get a hold of somebody soon, it's just not the same as seeing somebody in person, really having that um, in-depth, you know, conversation and sharing new ideas. Um, and then, you know, just to hear about any new softwares they're using or um, new tips and tricks they have in their, in their office, you know, maybe, you know, everybody's kind of struggling with hiring. So are they doing something different with, you know, how they're finding new talent to join their group? So anything, those things are, they're, they're just invaluable. And I encourage everybody to attend them or, or find a good group of um, other administrators, whether in your field or outside your field to collaborate with. Fantastic. Talk about hiring. Um, and I think one of the net effects of COVID has been a real struggle that I've seen amongst other practices in retaining good talent and hiring um, also um, a new talent. Um, what are the tools that you as CEO have found most successful to find the best talent at the practice? Um, so we ha definitely have a mentality to hire for character, train for skill. So most of the staff that we bring on do not have any experience in ophthalmology, let alone retina, right? We want to make sure that we have somebody who is going to match our culture, that they want to be part of something bigger than themselves. They want to give back um, and they really want to collaborate with a great team, right? So if they meet a uh, match who we are as an organization, we will train them in any hard skills that they absolutely need. That is what I got 18, you know, 21 years ago at the age of 18. And that's what I believe. Um, me as the CEO, I think uh, me collaborating with my executive leadership, our managing partner on what we're doing well, areas we need to improve. Are we having any struggles with um, hiring? How long is it taking to get somebody in the door? Um, we're constantly revamping those processes to see if we can be better. Um, and then I participate in as many of the meetings as I possibly can with the team. If it's, you know, to create a, an internal like lean certification course or a leadership development course, right? We really support the growth of our individuals throughout the organization. I will participate on that. Um, we did one last night on conflict resolution, right? It seems that with COVID, you know, people are just generally angry and our welcome desk staff and kind of the frontline staff are really kind of taking a beating, right? They, nobody wants to wear the mask anymore. And yet, you know, everybody's giving them a hard time. And so we were just trying to provide them extra tips and, and tricks or whatever on how they can kind of deal with that conflict and, and feel supported throughout the organization on what they could and couldn't say. So as many of those things as I can participate on, I, I absolutely will, because I really like to connect with my staff. Right. So in over 20 years of working at the practice, I'm sure every day is a story. Every yeah. day you go into the practice, a patient comes in that's got this issue or one of the staff members, but within all the hundreds or thousands of stories which you have, has there been any particular experience that has left 
some sort of uh, you know, lasting impression on you and change the way in which uh, you operate or you want your staff to operate or how the practice can you know, provide the best uh, level of patient care? Wow. One story. <laughs> Only one. <laughs> wow. I mean, I think that, um, you know, uh, I was a, a, a scribe for 11 years with one of our providers who did uh, most of the pediatric retina um, in our practice. And I think that that was super valuable to learn how to connect with people in a different way. Obviously I was having to connect with all of our patients on a day-to-day basis, but when you're talking about a child and their parents who might lose their eye from a rare cancer or have to undergo chemotherapy at six months old, um, or seeing a baby, a neonate and then NICU, right. Who has 80 years of vision you're trying to save. I think that those cases were probably the most impactful for me and really trying to understand how to communicate with those families early on and offer them the support. Um, my, on a personal side, you know, my dad is a, is a type two diabetic and obviously that is a big part of our patient population. And so really seeing him struggle with that and not really understanding his disease in the general sense of how to care for himself and, and what that really means and relating that back to our patients. I think that gives me a diff- different aspect too, of wanting to offer as much support, not just from the retina perspective, but just the education of resources for them and, you know, nutritionists or dietitians or anybody that can help them with the holistic health portion, I think is really important to me as well. So, um, yeah, I, I just think that, you know, it's hard to do sometimes when you're in a really busy practice to not think about just what it is in front of you. I think, you know, our, our healthcare system is very, you know, divided, right. We each have our own subspecialties, you know, and we just check off our box and move the patient along. So anything that I think you can do to add and and subsidize a great care and and experience with the patient is really important. Thank you so very much for sharing that, Stephanie. And um, it's true. We, you know, go into the office day in, day out, but we're really caring and changing. You are really changing people's lives and uh, helping them, helping them along in their, in their own, in their own journeys and your uh, stories. Thank you. And your experience has been um, so valuable. I know for your own staff and your guidance and your leadership. And thank you once again for sharing that uh, a little bit for us uh, today and um, enjoy the conference next week. And hopefully we'll be able to catch up and see you very, very soon uh, in person. So thank you uh, so very much for uh, joining us today on Sergi Pod. Thank you, Justin. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening to Sergipod. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcast to stay up to date with new episodes.